Thank you, Adrian. Well, it's been a blessing to have Brother Shannon with us today. Amen. And me and him talks a lot when they come down, and it's usually on the Bible, more or less. And uh, we try to glean from one another, and we do to a certain extent. But he is our missionary, and we try to help him financially and doing the ministry he's doing. And I'm going to go ahead and say this, and then he'll get the big head. I was in mission work for over 15 years. And I had a position at the end. I was over all of Latin America, the missionaries with the organization I was with. Never seen anybody doing what he's doing. Never. Now, I've seen missionaries do great things. And they do great things. But he stretched himself out over the continent and just not one city or one place. And he's doing it right. He's training men to go back, if they desire, and God calls them, to the country they came from and win their people to the Lord. Uh, one of my preacher boys down in Peru that we trained in disciple, he's in the jungle of Peru. And he's, a, I call him a <laughs> circuit riding preacher. But he's got the largest church in the jungle in Peru. But yet he don't stay there. He lives there, and him and his wife and children. But every week he's gone somewhere else, planting some more seed, planting some more seed. See, so Stockton Baptist Church shouldn't sit here. Did you hear all them amens? Amen. Amen. That's not what it's about. It's about reproduction. Reproduction. The Bible says some sow some water and God gives the increase. And we got to be doing one or the other, sowing a water, if we expect to increase. But anyhow, I'm not going to preach it. Uh, I'm stealing his fire or whatever. But I ask him tonight especially to speak on missions. Now, he said a little bit about it this morning. But I want him to say more and help us to understand <coughs> what's involved in mission work. He said the truth this morning when he told his friend he wanted to know how long it would take him to learn the Spanish language fluently. Ten years. You ain't going to learn it quick. Oh, you'll be able to say good morning, good night, where do you live, what's your telephone number, <laughs> and where's the bathroom. But you're not going to learn the language, I promise you. Come on, Brother Shannon. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Don't let that discourage you if you want to learn Spanish, though. If you're young, you can learn it in about 10 months. It just depends on how young you are. If you're uh, Ashley and Kayla, they were three and five when we went to Argentina. And within six months, and I was studying it every single day, and within six months, they were better than I was. And it wasn't close. And that's the truth, you know. So it's, it's, you're, you just don't hear it the same once you get past a certain age. And, but the earlier you can get it, you can get really good at it if you're young. And if you're not so young, then you got to try really hard. That's the way it works. But uh, missions, what is missions? Missions is just simply uh, going and make disciples of all nations. That's what Jesus has called us to do. Yes, so we all have to ask ourselves, what is my responsibility in that? What can I do where I am in my particular context? What can you do? Uh, here, is, here in Stockton Baptist Church. And uh, obviously one of the things we can do is what we talked about this morning, and that's having an evident faith, faith and an evangelistic faith, right? We have to be evangelists. We have to win people uh, in our own context, in our own, our, in our own place of uh, work, in our own hometown. We have to do that, and uh, that's the first part. Uh, all of us really are, in that sense, missionaries. But uh, on a broad scale, on a global scale, what do we have to do? Well, we have to pray that God will send laborers into the harvest. And uh, when you do that, you're really volunteering yourself. You're really saying, Lord, if it's your will, I'll go too. So that's a prayer of surrender. That's one thing you have to do. The other thing you have to do is to, is to give. You know, if we're going to send missionaries out, we have to give. 
Uh, we have to take care of our church here, absolutely, but we also have to give so people can be saved around the world. So it's an investment. Anytime you give, you're going to get it back tenfold, uh, not only here, but in heaven someday, where it's going to be even more important. Are you going to have any, any crowns when you get to heaven? And really, that's something all of us should ask ourselves. So we're going to talk a little bit about giving tonight, and I'm not going to be real detailed in percentages and stuff like that. It's going to be a, a, a broad look at, uh, at giving. And really the subject matter is simply this. God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver because God is a cheerful giver. Amen. Have you ever thought about that? Amen. God's a cheerful giver. You know, my daughter uh, Ashley, my oldest daughter Ashley, and her husband Stephen, they're hosting an exchange student from China this year. So they got a real live Chinese girl living with them. And she, uh, she came to, uh, I guess she came to live with them at the end of August, the school year. She's 17 years old. And um, she came in and she met us and she was very nice. And, and she, Ashley, in a sense, is her parent, even though Ashley's only 26 years old. In this sense, she's her parent for, the, for this school year. And she said, may I call you grandfather? And I said, no, no, you don't, you don't really need to call me grandfather. Now, if, if, uh, if you were 17 months old and wanted to call me grandfather, that'd be one thing. But I'm not ready to be a grandfather of a 17-year-old, you know? And I thought, you know, I might look like a grandfather, but I'm not a grandfather, not just yet. So why don't we just, you know, you just call me Shannon or Mr. Hampton or whatever you're comfortable with, I'll be fine. And, and then here a little later, she very humbly said, I have prepared some gifts. And she gave us a little trinket, little gifts for all of us. And it was really sweet. And uh, she, uh, you might say that she was a, a cheerful giver. She wanted to honor us as uh, the parents of her parents, uh, at least while she's here in the States. And the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And if you ever read Paul's philosophy when it comes to giving, it's found in Acts 20 and verse 35, where he simply says, uh, it's better to give than to receive. Of course, Jesus Christ said said that. It's better to give than to receive. Now, why do we think it's better to give than to receive? Why is that? Because if you've got something uh, to give, it means you've got something extra, yeah. right? Yeah. You've got a little more than enough. It means, it means you've been blessed. Or it means you may not have, but barely enough to take care of yourself, but God gives you the grace and the faith to go ahead and give anyway, knowing that He's going to take care of you, even though you don't know where it's coming from. Either way, you're happier if you give than if you don't. You're happier if you give than if you don't. You're happier if you're more thankful than if you're not. And people who are thankful tend to be more giving. You know, in fact, I just saw some statistics. I was looking at a, at a Thanksgiving message last week. And according to the statistics, people who are thankful are happier and live longer lives and also make more money. How about that? So being thankful, that doesn't cost you anything, but you're going to make more money if you're thankful. Maybe because you've got a, a positive attitude. Also, I, I, I saw this. If you have a pet, you're also going to live longer and be happier and be healthier. But only because you're going to have to walk that dog. That's the only reason you're going to be any healthier. <laughs> People who don't have to walk the dog are probably just going to sit in the house. You know, my son Brett, he has to be walked. I take Brett on a walk. Because he gets, he'll just stare at that computer and play his little games and listen to his little songs all day. And so I have to take him out and we have to go for a walk. If not, he'll just sit there and it's not good for him. It's not healthy for him. I have to take him out for a walk. That's healthy for me. It's healthy for him, right? <laughs> but God wants us to be thankful. He wants us to be uh, cheerful givers. Because he himself is a cheerful giver. Notice what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 7. Our first point tonight is that God gives willingly. Everything that you have has come from God. Amen. And everything that you have, He willingly gave to you. Yes. God is not uh, someone who, is, who gives grudgingly. Look at uh, verse number 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The Bible says, um, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly yes. or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Amen. Because God is, I might add, a cheerful giver. You know, uh, nobody makes God give anything. He doesn't have to give us anything. He gives because that's His nature. The Bible says that God is love, and love always gives, yeah. right? Yeah. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and God has always given us His best. God is a cheerful giver. He desires to share His blessings with us simply because He loves us. Just like you give gifts to your children, 
Nobody gives a, a, a gift to their child and think, well, I wish I didn't have to give my child this gift. No, we love our children. They're precious to us. They're like us. They have our same DNA and we love them. We look, recognize that they're gifts from God and they enrich our lives. So we love to give gifts to our children. And we're not even perfect. God is perfect. How much more does He love to give to us? What I'm talking about here is motive. What is the motive for our giving? The motive for our giving is that God has given us everything. Amen. He's given us everything that we've got. All of our blessings come from Him. I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, God loves us not because we're nice, but because He's love. Amen. God uh, gives not because He needs to receive, but because He delights in giving. Yes. God doesn't need anything from us. Right. When we give, it's to our benefit. God is the owner of everything. It's a ridiculous notion that we can give something to God because He needs it. God doesn't need it, but we need to give because we need to get closer to God. And we need to be more thankful. And giving promotes both of those things. So all of our blessings come from God. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 17. The Word of God says... Charge them that are rich in this world that they may not be high-minded. And you say, well, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not rich in this world. <laughs> oh, you are. Oh, yes. I, I bet you are. Yes. You really are. I've been to some, uh, they're called sugarcane villages down in the Dominican Republic. Amen. That's where the Haitians uh, live, many of the people from Haiti. And uh, people in Haiti are, are so poor that they think going to the Dominican Republic is going to make them rich. The average person in the Dominican Republic, you want to know what they make? If you get you a good factory job, uh, maybe making Timberland shoes or maybe making some pants at the Zona Libre, the, uh, the free zone where they have all the factories there in Santiago, you'll make about $180 a month. That's about what the, that's what, about what the maids make too. $180 a month. And that's what people live on. That's what a lot of people live on. They say only 5% of the world makes $25,000 a year or more. We don't think $25,000 is that much money, do we? Only 5% of the world makes that. If you've got a house and a car and you make $50,000 a year, you know where you are? You are in the 1%. Wow. Wow, we don't think of it like that because we compare ourselves to other people in America and we've become a ridiculously rich country and we don't even know how good we've got it. That's right. We don't even know how good we've got it. I was just down in the Dominican Republic and the pastor there is middle class. He's a graduate of our Bible Institute. He's smart. He's got a wife and two kids. He lives in a little bitty apartment. You can't hardly turn around in it. No air conditioning. They're happy to have hot water. They've got plenty to eat. He pastors a nice church. He's great. He's doing fine for the Dominican Republic. But by our standards, he has to pay rent because he can't afford to get a mortgage on a $55,000 apartment down there. Can't even get a mortgage on that. He said the interest is too high. Because if you buy a house down there, you're gonna, it's like buying it on a credit card. You don't get it for 3.5%, 4%. No. You're going to pay about 17 18% to get a mortgage. He can't afford that. He can't, afford, he, can't, he can't even afford the down payment. And he's doing pretty good. He pastors a church of 250, 300 people down there. They're doing good. Middle class church. He's a middle class guy. So we don't realize what we've got. Anyway, so what it says here in verse number 17, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded uh, or proud, uh, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. Boy, you're talking about common grace. He's given us all things richly to enjoy. Everything that we've got is a gift from Him. Everything that we've got. We need to recognize that. We need to recognize how good God has been to us. Now, sometimes it's tempting to think, now, wait a minute, I have to work hard for my money. And that's true. And you know what? God respects that. And God values hard work. And, uh, but we have to recognize something. Who is it that has given us uh, our intelligence, our strength, everything that we've got to be able to go out and earn a living? It's all from Him. You know, I see that by having a son with special needs. He can't take care of himself. He doesn't have the wherewithal. He doesn't have the capacity. He doesn't have the intellectual capacity to be able to take care of himself because he's disabled, because he has autism. He's got severe autism. Many people with autism can function a lot better than, than Brett has. 
But we've had to work really hard just to get Brett to be as well off as he is. But he'll never be able to take care of himself. And yet we take these things for granted. We take these things for granted every single day. And God says, here it is. I've given you all that. Psalm 116, 12 says, What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits toward me? That's a good verse. You know why? Because it makes the implication is we have to think of all the benefits that God has given us. We have to sit there and, and, and write them all down and recognize He is the ultimate source of everything I've got. As King David said in the Psalms, He heals all our, disease, our diseases and loads us yes. daily with benefits. Yes. He loads us daily Amen. with good things. He's a provider of everything that we have, yes. both spiritually and physically. You know, uh, it's a really good exercise to just maybe take a walk and reflect on everything God's given you. I took about a two or three mile walk on Thanksgiving because I knew I was going to eat too much. Uh, boy, we had a deep fried turkey. And I don't care if I ever eat another baked turkey again. Because that deep fried turkey was, it was money. I've never had a deep fried turkey, but that's, that, that thing was good. But anyway, I knew I was going to eat too much. And so I went out and went on a walk. And while I was walking, I listened to some Christian music. And I just started thanking God for all of the benefits. It was Thanksgiving. I thought, you know, it would be appropriate just to sit here and or walk around here and think about everything that I've got and all the blessings that I've got and how good God has been to me and, and, and just think about my health and, and, my, and my family. And, man, it was good. It was good. It's a healthy exercise to just, to just be quiet before the Lord and be thankful. I'd recommend it. And then later before we ate... We all gathered around in a circle. And there was a lot of people there at the, at the house, probably I don't know, 25 or 30 people, something like that. And we all gathered around and we sang, uh, we sang a verse of, Great is thy faithfulness. Yep. Man, it was good. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? We should do this on a whole lot more regular basis Amen. than just once a year. Sure. You know, God says that we should be thankful every day. We should give thanks for everything that we've got. And everything give thanks for this is the will of God concerning you. And everything give thanks. So that's our God. And that's what we've got. Then God also gives generously. He not only gives willingly, but He gives generously. And Jesus is really the greatest example of, of God's generosity. The Bible says that He became rich uh, so to make us... Uh, he became rich. Wait a minute. He was rich. He became poor. He became poor to make us rich. Yes. Yes. You know, a lot of people give to the poor. A lot of people give to the poor. In fact, it's a lot easier to raise money. Uh, if you are in the humanitarian aid business than it is if you're in the gospel business. That's the truth. You know why? Because people want to feel good. They want, it's instant. It's instant. If I give, I know that, uh, that little Jose down in Mexico or, or some small child in, in Africa or whatever, they're going to be fed. And, and that's great. And that's wonderful. It's fantastic. I am all for that. But how much more needful is it to make disciples? Man, it's more needful because yes. we can feed them, and that's great, and we should feed them. Praise the Lord. In fact, I read recently where we've gotten so good at feeding people that uh, hunger has almost been eradicated around the world. Can you imagine that? Praise the Lord for that. And God is good. That's wonderful. But how much more do we as Christians need to say, we need to do our part in both prayer and in winning other people and in giving so other people can go out into the harvest field and make disciples because that was the greatest commandment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. His last command was what? Yes, sir. He had one. What was it? He said it five times. He said it in every gospel and in the first chapter of Acts. What did he say? Go and make disciples. Go and preach the gospel. Go and tell them and teach them to observe what I have commanded you. That's what he said. And he said it five times. And that was the last time. And then we say, well, wait a minute. That was just for the disciples. That was just for the apostles. But here's the thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul said, Everyone who has been reconciled unto God has been given the ministry of reconciliation. And that God is is crying out through our voices that people be reconciled to God. So if we've been reconciled, we are reconcilers. Yes. That's our responsibility. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation. That is the greatest responsibility that we have. God has given generously our Savior Jesus Christ, and so we're to give generously to be able to uh, make a difference in people's lives. I said all that to say this. A lot of people give to the poor, and that's fine. In 2016, uh, Bill Gates, the uh, founder of Microsoft, uh, Bill Gates donated almost $3 billion. $3 billion with a B. 
That's 3,000 million, put it in those kind of terms, 3 billion in 2016. And we think, good grief, that's a lot of money. But that didn't hurt Bill Gates any. Bill Gates is worth $90 billion. And now that he's drawn in, that was in 2016. Now that he's drawn interest, he's probably worth $100 billion. Now that it's almost 2018. But either way, those donations, that's pretty admir admirable. You know, that's pretty, that's pretty admirable. It really is. But he's not making himself poor. See, Jesus, who was rich, made himself yes. poor. Yes. Right? Because he was the king of the universe, and he left all that to become a man. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. Notice what the Bible says. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that ye through His poverty might be rich. Yes. Now, a lot of people have interpreted this over the years to mean that, that Jesus was just dirt poor. But here's the thing. By our standards, everybody was dirt poor back then. Yeah. Jesus was probably a middle class person for His age, for the, for the age in which He lived. Did you know that? Uh, he was a carpenter, Right? He took care of his mother until he was 30 years old. We know that he had supporters. We know that several uh, women and other people supported his ministry. We know that. We know that they had a bag of money, right? Because Judas was in charge of the bag of money, and he'd steal it. So there was enough for him to steal a little bit, and yet they could still manage, right? And so Jesus, for his, uh, for his era, wasn't poor in the way that we consider poverty. He was far from any kind of a beggar like the poor and those people in their day. And of course he had access uh, to be able to pay his taxes. He told Peter to, you know, to go, go, go fishing and all of a sudden you'll be able to find uh, enough money to pay your taxes. That'd be good for us, wouldn't it? I'd like to, I'd like to try that. <laughs> That'd be a nice thing to be able to do. Right? So in, in what way was Jesus poor? Because some people have said to be like Jesus you have to take a vow of poverty and be poor in the way we consider regular poverty. But that's not true. That's not, that's not what the Bible teaches at all. He was poor, the Bible says, simply by becoming a man. He was rich in what sense? He had everything in heaven. He was the king of glory. Angels bowed down to him constantly. He had perfect fellowship with his father, perfect happiness. And he left all that to become, to become a man. And to, become to, this, to come to this cruel and wicked and sinful and dark and violent world where he would be criticized and, 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 and spat upon and eventually killed for our sakes. Though he was rich in heaven, he became poor on earth. He humbled himself and became a man and suffered death, even the death on a cruel cross. That's what Jesus did to become poor. Now... For us to maybe to understand this a little bit better, uh, how many people have taken a mission trip to a foreign country? All right, we've got a few. Where have you been? I know where y'all have been. <laughs> y'all been everywhere. <laughs> the Allens have been everywhere. Where did y'all go? We've been about 30-something different countries. 30-something different countries. All right, what's... Central America. Mostly Central America. Africa and Russia. All right. All right, now I've, been to, I've never been to Africa. I've heard that's some real live poverty, like a lot worse than what you're going to get in Guatemala, Right? All right, but I've been to I've been to the poorest places. I've, the two poorest places I've ever seen are the the sugarcane villages in Dominican Republic where the Haitians live. That's just dirt poor. I mean, they're so poor you can see that the the there's a funny look in their eye because they're hungry. That's that's poor. And same thing in in one little place in Guatemala that is so godforsaken that we had to drive. Woo, five hours from the airport and then another hour and a half until the van got stuck and then we had to walk another two hours and a guy from our Bible Institute that graduated from our Bible Institute went out there and started a church in the middle of absolutely nowhere. This place called Tres Pinos, which means three pine trees. And I didn't see the first pine tree <laughs> while I was there. <laughs> but I did see a lot of beautiful a lot of, uh, lot of beautiful uh, coffee plants, and, and it was very green and everything. But we got there, and we went in. They had a dirt floor. The guy was as skinny as a rail. He had a far-off look in his eye. And his wife was sweeping the, the dirt with some kind of a grassy look, like a stick, with about 10 looking strands of grass on it. Just, just unbelievably poor. And a lot of us have gone, we'll go and we'll visit them. And we'll help them out, and we'll do what we can. 
But I don't know the first person from a first world country that would go to a place like Tres Pinos and live. Yeah. Yeah. And leave it all behind. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I go to the Dominican Republic and into a big city and, and go to the pastor's apartment, stay with him for a week. And it's hard to sleep because there's not any air conditioning. And you're sleeping in a kid's bed and the, and the pillow's about that thick. And I'm tempted to think, man, this, this good grief, I just can't st and then I think, Wait a minute, what, what did Jesus do? Yes, yes. Man, He left it all. Amen. He left it all yes. for me. You see, if an American who, who had a nice car and a nice home and, and air conditioning and everything that we take for granted over here, it's just part of it living in 21st century America. We all take it for granted. Yes. Now, if we were to leave that and go to Trace Pinos and live with those people on those dirt floors and barely have enough to survive, that's a little bit more like what Jesus did for us. He left it all yes, yes. and went to a place that was completely foreign to His perfect environment in heaven. That's what Jesus did for us. Amen. Why would He do such a thing? Mm. Why would He do something like that? Mm. Well, He wanted to make us rich. Yes. See, for your sake, <laughs> He became poor. He left it all <coughs> so that we could have abundant life. You see, he had to suffer the poverty of sin. He had to suffer the punishment of sin. He had to endure the cross, Hebrews 12 says, yes. for the joy that was set before him. Yes. What was the joy that was set before him? I believe it's one of Brother Allen's favorite songs. When he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Amen. Yes. Yes. That was the joy that was set before him. Yeah. He was thinking about all those people, millions upon millions upon me, millions of people who were going to be saved because of his sacrifice. And how God, His Father, was going to be glorified. That's what he was thinking about. The joy that was set before him. The joy of the salvation of men to the glory of God the Father. Wow. That's what he was thinking about. For our sakes. So that we could become rich, he became poor. He endured that kind of suffering that we might experience abundant life. Yes, yes. That's the kind of God that we have. Amen. That's the motive for your giving right there. Yes. That's the motive. It's not, well, we've got to take care of the pastor. Yeah, we've got to take care of the pastor. That's not really the motive. The motive is, man, <laughs> wow. You, you mean the recommended amount is only 10%? Are you kidding me? When he's the owner of 100% and he's given me everything I've got and, and the recommended amount, <laughs> it's only 10%. Wow, what a blessing. And I can give over and above that to help other people and to send the gospel around the world. Yeah, I'm, I'm in on that. Because He left it all for me. That's it. That's it. That's why we give. You know, we, 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 we try to... I don't, I, I don't know if I should say this. Can I say that? You might get mad at me. I hope he, I hope he doesn't get mad at me. You know, it seems like the church at large, for years and years and years, we've been telling people, now, you need to give that 10%. Or God might put you in the hospital. Right. Or your car might break down. I've heard, do you ever heard that one? Oh, yes. Well, his car broke down, he's probably not a tither. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. That's, that's not why we give. No. no, no. That's completely foreign to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians, 8 and chap 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, read it. Yeah. Read it over and over again. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves the person that says, wow, Lord, you've given me everything. Here you go. I'm happy to give. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I could give more, but thank you for what I can give. God, thank you. That's why we give, because of what he's done for us. But we've got it in our mind that, you know, we've got to beat people up. And you've got to give it or you're just gonna, you know, your car's going to break down. You'll end up in the hospital. Who knows what's going to happen to you? You better give it because God's going to get it. No, no. No, we give because God loves us and because we love God. That's why we give. Amen. That's why we give. That's the only reason to give. You see, uh, he gave for what purpose? He gives to demonstrate his grace, and he loves to do so. We give to demonstrate our gratitude. That's why we yes. give. Yes. That's grace giving. Lord, thank you. Here you go. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver. He gives willingly. He gives generously. Now then, uh, are you a cheerful giver? 
Are you a cheerful giver? Do you give because you're happy that God has blessed you so and that you're happy to be able to give, to be able to invest in eternity, to be able to invest in the souls of men to the glory of God? That's why we should give. And so um, Paul gives us a couple guidelines, and I'm going to look at them quickly. One is the law of the harvest. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 6. <clears throat> but this I say, he uh, which soweth uh, sparingly shall reap also sparingly. That's right here in the chapter on giving. You want to you be blessed of God? In a myriad, myriad ways, not just financially, but in all kinds of ways. You, wanna, you want your faith to grow? He who uh, uh, sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also yes. bountifully. Amen. Amen. The law of the harvest. So if you want to see more of the power of God unleashed in your life, you should be willing to give. If you want to see your faith grow, if you want to see your faith grow, you should be willing to give. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'll tell you this. Anybody here that's been giving systematically uh, for a long time, and when I say systematically, I don't mean I'm giving $5 a week. I'm trusting God for it. No, I mean really giving <laughs> systematically whatever the percentage might be, but really given systematically over the course of time is not worried about it because they know. They know God's going to take care of me. I'm going to be fine. I can give this because I know God is faithful. I know God is going to take care of me. And I happily give this because I'm investing in God's work. I'm investing in the souls of men. I'm investing in eternity. And I can't outgive God. The law of the harvest. Uh, I think it's a principle that holds true today where, God, where the Bible says God says to test him, Malachi, test him to see if he doesn't open the windows of heaven and pour out his blessings on you. Well, that's in the Old Testament, but I think we see the same thing here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, right? The law of the harvest. If you give, if you give bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully, says the Word of God. Just try God out, test him. He'll take care of you if you're willing to give. We can't outgive God. And so God gives generously and so should we. Christmas is coming up. And I know a lot of y'all are going to, a lot of you men out there, you're going to, you, you're, you're shot. He was probably at the mall shopping for his wife. That's probably what he was doing. She wasn't there and he was out thinking of her. Oh, what can I get for my precious wife? It's Christmas is coming up. I got to get her something good. Right? But all you men, you're getting ready for Christmas. And nobody goes out and thinks, how little can I get away with? Now, you might think that if you don't really love your wife. But if you love your wife, you're thinking, how much can I spend? How much can we afford? Because I want to give her something. Man, I want to give her something that cost me something. And if I have to work a little overtime or if I have to sell something on the, time, on the side, whatever I have to do, then I'm going to raise enough money to be able to give my wife a great gift because I love my wife. And I want to be able to, everybody's laughing like this, like y'all don't really love your wives. <laughs> I see a lot of people have been married a long time here. I think that might, that might play into this thing. I don't know. Let's assume you're newlywed. <laughs> and then it's like, I want to really make my wife happy this year. And so I'm going to spend all the money I can. I'm not going to spend as little as I can get away with. How, if I, let's see if I can get something good on sale and fool her into thinking I've spent a lot of money on her. That's not, that's not the attitude. Not if we really love our wives. So why should we feel any different when it comes to loving God? Amen. David said, I'm not going to give to God that which costs me nothing. Yeah. I'm going to give to God yes. something that costs me something. Because yeah. I want to honor Him. I don't want to give silver. I want to give gold. Right? I want to give God the best that I can possibly give. Yes. Yes. I give this gener off generous offering to honor my Lord and Savior. Amen. One more verse, one passage of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. We'll close with this. And um, everybody uses this for all kinds of giving, but in context, it's really the missionary giving. That's what it is. Yes, it is. In the context of, of missions giving. Let's just start with uh, verse number 14 and go through verse number 19 so we'll get the whole context. And it says, Paul says to the church at, uh, at Philippi, Notwithstanding you have, done, uh, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Paul was in prison. And his, uh, his jail cell was really a rented house. 
And so being in a rented house, he had to be able to pay the rent. Otherwise, he'd end up in a lot worse place. And so the Philippians sent an offering through Epaphroditus, and they took care of Paul so he could live in a rented house during his confinement, albeit still cha chained to a, a Roman soldier, but at least he had a house to live in. He was under house arrest as opposed to some dungeon somewhere. Somebody had to pay for that. You know who paid for it? The Philippians. Because they thought they would invest in this guy named Paul. They thought that guy might be going somewhere. A pretty good investment. Pretty good investment. And it says, by the way, there's a lot of good missionaries out there. And I know that some are going to come by here and, and share their heart and share their burden with you and share their ministry. And, and I know this church is going to do a great job in, in, in helping those guys out and getting the gospel out around the world. We love it that you support us, but I want you guys to support a lot of people. Uh, because I know that there's so many guys that are preaching the gospel, doing a great job, and so many other souls that need to be saved, different kinds of ministries and things. But we've got to do all do our part to get the gospel out. So um, notice with me, it says, Now you Philippians know also, verse 15, that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, from Macedonia, no church communicated with me. In other words, nobody supported me financially except you. You were the only ones. Nobody else did. As concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Paul was a missionary. He had missionary support. They prayed for Paul. They loved Paul. They gave Paul money because they wanted to see people saved all around the Roman Empire. And so they invested in Paul's ministry. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift. Paul says, I know God's going to take care of me, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. See, anytime you invest in a soul being saved, whether it's here in Stockton, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in Africa, whether it's around the world, wherever it might be, that's fruit to your account. And God keeps perfect records. Joe Smith from Stockton Baptist Church. Is there Joe Smith here? Okay, I was just kind of making that up. Joe Smith from Stockton Baptist Church gave X amount. And a guy in Guatemala got saved. And 10 churches in Latin America got started. And some people got saved over in Africa. Fruit to your account. And you're going to get to heaven one day. Yeah. And you're going to shake yeah. those people's hands. And God's going to say, wow, this guy got saved because you were willing to give. Because you were willing to pray. Because you were willing to do your part. That's what missions is. It's an investment in eternity. A lot of times you may not see it here. You can read about it in some of our prayer letters and stuff. But you're really going to see it one day when you get to heaven. But then it says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now I want you to think about Thanksgiving dinner. It's all fresh in our mind. You go in there, ooh, man, that smells good. And you know somebody's been working. I didn't realize all the work that went into turkey preparation. That's a big deal. It's like days in the making, that thing, right? And you go in there and you smell that and you know, wow, somebody loves me. Somebody's been working hard. Somebody has made this sacrifice. And so when we give to God, the Bible says that's a blessing to God. It's a sweet smelling sacrifice to God. Imagine that. We think that God can bless us and he certainly does, but we can bless God by giving. It's a sweet smelling. The Bible says uh, uh, the things which were sent from you. The missionary offering to God is an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Amen. That's why you should give. That's it. And not to mention the fact yeah. that my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. There it is. You can bless God and God says, oh, by the way, I'm going to supply all your needs yeah. as well. Yeah. You can't beat that deal. God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver because God is a cheerful giver. Yes. Let's be cheerful givers. Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your kindness and your goodness toward us, Lord. Uh, we're undeserving, and yet you lavishly bless us day after day after day after day, Lord. Help us to think of you as a cheerful giver who willingly and lovingly and kindly gives us all things richly to enjoy. Let us remember that as we go about our business each and every day, that the food we eat, the houses that we enjoy, the cars that we drive, all that is a tremendous blessing from your hand. And without you, we would have none of that, none of it. 
And so, Lord, help us to realize we owe it all to you. And we have the privilege of giving some back, knowing that it blesses you. Help us to bless you, Lord, because you're worthy, because you're good. And, Father, uh, help us to always be thankful that you will always supply our needs according to your riches and glory, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor. Let's stand our feet if you would.